Today is the 27th of March. This is my grandfather, Tom Powell. We're interviewing today about the waters of the family gun. All right, so how would you say that uh, you are related to the waters of the family gun? Well, I've fished on it and hunted around it for, I guess, 30 some years. Must be around 35, 40 years now. All right. Uh, and I stay down there as much as I can stay on it as much as I can. So you would say, do uh, you like it? you like the waters there? Oh yeah, uh, that's one of the reasons I stay here. Um, after I finished graduate school, I just decided I liked it that you got to be able to get up here from where I came from. And uh, it's near the water, plenty of hunting, good hunting, fishing, and that's the biggest reason I decided to stay here. And that Pamlico River and Sound is a draw or drawing card for me. I just can't stay away from it. <laughs> All right. So, um, so I guess you would say you're a fisherman then. You've been a fisherman. Like your fish, life. Uh, saltwater fish particularly. Um, I've really done most of my saltwater fishing since I came here, moved here to this area. Okay. Um, I've also also liked to crab. Mm -hmm. you know, not commercially, but just right. Well, touching on that, I actually have a little issue that I wanted to bring up. Um, so, as a saltwater fisherman, are you perturbed by the trawling and the netting that goes on in the Pamlico Sound? Because I know there's been an increase in that lately. Well, I think there's there's some excessive commercial fishermen fishing around our area here. Um, I think. I have to say, I think the sports fishing may have also contributed to some of the decline of some of the species, like the gray trout, for example. So I think it's a combination of both, but I do think that, you know, the way the commercial fishing, fishing has been going in terms of where boats can go, fishing mm -hmm. boats can go, right. uh, creates a problem for me personally. Um, I understand people have to make a living, and mm -hmm. I don't have any problem with that, but it just seems like that you just see trawlers, shrimp trawlers, especially fishing boats up in areas where in other waters in other states you would not find it right. because it would be illegal to do so. But that's just my feeling about it. All right. Um, so what types of fish do you usually catch when you go? Um, speckled trout, uh, flounder, croaker, spot, um, Virginia mullet. Mm -hmm. And that variety. And sometimes you catch different species, but that's what I like to catch mostly. Um, out of those, is there a specific species that you've seen a decline in recently? Um, yeah, you know, fishing populations vary from year to year, weather, fishing pressure, and that sort of thing uh, de determines that. But it seems to me that there's been a decline in gray trout fishing. You hardly see a gray trout anymore. I haven't caught one of those in two or three years. You still really like to get catch them. Right. Um, the that decline, I think, probably can be traced to my way of thinking to excessive commercial fishermen fishing. Uh, I, I'm not sure about that in terms of talking to anybody, but just what I've heard and what I've experienced myself. Seems like there's been a decline in that particular species. Now again, some years you have great flounder years, some years you don't. Some years you catch a lot of puppy drums, some years you don't. It's just it's just the way things go in terms of weather and and, and that sort of thing. All right. Um, something else that uh, recently came up. There was a report of a uh, great white shark traveling into the Pamlico Sound and feeding. Um, do you think that that could be uh, caused by the recent increase in fishing? I, I'm really not sure about that. I'm not certain whether or not these sharks haven't been there for a while. You know, people have seen a few more of them now than they used to, it seems like to be. But even You've seen several instances of sharks in the Pamlico Sound? Um, I have, and just a few years back, I was still teaching at Beaufort then. 
your daddy and I went fishing early one morning down on Lower Spring Creek. And we got, when we put the boat out and went out, it was just so slick and quiet. You see schools of Menhaden all over the place. And we kind of had that old electric trolling motor going and we were casting out along the bank of trout. And all of a sudden we heard this big commotion look behind us. It was a school of Menhaden just going crazy out there. So we figured, well, hmm, what, this, what is this? Let's go fish around them. But we really didn't get a chance to do that because all of a sudden this fin popped up out of water. Mm. And it started going lazy circles around that school of Menhaden. They were trying to get out of there, I guess. And then all of a sudden it cut right in across those Menhaden. You'd see them just shower out of water. Dang. And when, when, the, when the shark is what it turned out to be, I guess it was probably a, it wasn't a great white or anything like that. It might have been a bull shark. Came up, flashed right down into those trout, those uh, those uh, Ben Hayden again. That was fascinating to see, and it, we watched that that shark feed on Ben Hayden for another 10, 15 minutes. Hmm. And it always do the same thing. We go into the center of that school and chew up the chew up the Ben Hayden, and there'd be little pieces of Ben Hayden coming all out, and then it would go back out and start that slow circle around to get them to ball up. Those Ben Hayden to ball up, mm -hmm. and then it would. Cut back through there again. As far as I know, there's only one shark. But that was a fascinating thing. And, and and I think that's the first time that I ever really could say that I saw a shark in the in, in, in the Pamlico River or a tributary thereof. Right. And we were not far, of course, from, at that point from Sam. But mm -hmm. um, it was a fascinating thing to see. And I, that's one of the my great stories that I remember of you know, fishing that area. Okay. Um... And I know you were also a professor at Beaufort. So what was uh, teaching on the water like? Thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I, used to, I used to take my boat to work with me, mm -hmm. a little 15-foot glass master, and I'd haul it to work. And I'd park it out there on the men with my truck out on the service road that kind of would parallel 264, and I'd get out of class. I'd head right to my truck, take on off to the fish somewhere. <laughs> and so... Uh, Oh, it was great for me. I mean, now, um, I understand you were a professor at Beaufort. Um, how would you describe your experience teaching on the water? Oh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, I had good students from that area. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. It was never like work, you know. I went to work every day, but it wasn't like that. I mean, it just was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I enjoyed working near the water because oftentimes I just take my boat to work with me. Right. Particularly in those earlier years I was there. <laughs> we only had two places, two buildings on campus, and I uh, would park my boat and truck along the service road and just take off after work and go down to a creek somewhere. Nice. Start to catch a puppy drum or a, or a bass or something. I mean, a old uh, flounder or something. Oh, okay. And that was fun. I really enjoyed it. It was great. And um, I understand... You taught anatomy, is that right? I taught anatomy and general biology both. All right. So I'm sure you saw students from all over. I did. Mm -hmm. um, all over the area. Are there any, I guess, students or any certain stories that you find memorable? There are, there are a lot of them. For the sake of, the sake of time, though, uh, I remember one particular individual that sticks out in my mind because Every time I drive through Bath, and which is often in the summertime, uh, I think of this person. I'm not going to name any names now, but uh, he was quite a character. He was a good student, but he was very, uh, can we say, I won't say backward, that's not the word to use. It's more like he was more self-sufficient, let's put it that way. He, he, uh, he basically lived on his own. He crabbed, he net fished, he you know, hunted duck hunted, all of that. And he basically ate what he caught or killed. Oh, wow. And he read, uh, uh, read. he grew vegetables. And uh, he turned out to be a good student. And, I, and I, th I think he finished at ECU, finished his BS degree at ECU. Oh, okay. Um, or BA, I'm not certain which. But he was quite a character. He was, he was funny. He had a good sense of humor. Looked at life, he had a very positive outlook on life, and he was a joy to teach. 
but I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to name any names or anything like that now. All right. And uh, just as a quick aside, how long were you a professor at Buford? It was about 30, I'm going to say 35 years hmm. altogether. All right. Um, let's see. Do you have any interesting stories while you were teaching, like fishing or about school, either one? I have probably a lot of them. One thing I, you know, we were talking about sharks and fishing in general. Uh, I think one of the most interesting stories I, I had was with the, I was telling about the shark that I saw in the Lower Spring Creek. Uh -huh. And I was fishing with your dad, we were fishing for trout and drum, and way in the back, really. And it was one of those really slick, quiet mornings, very early, the sun was just coming up. And uh, we saw all this disturbance on the water. There's you know, lots of schools of menhaden in at that time. And something was just tearing up those menhaden, balling them up and going right through them. And doggone, a couple minutes later, we saw a shark's fin pop up. Mm. And he would take these lazy circles around that school of uh, menhaden that would dive right through it. You know? okay. It would shower out of there. And that was a fascinating thing because I really believe that was the first time I ever actually saw a shark in, in action um, in the Pamlico, Pamlico River or Sam. Nice. And that's probably about, it's probably about seven or eight years ago. Hmm. All right. Um, well, I think I just have one more question. Um, and this is kind of a personal question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that you and I always used to do when I was younger. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember we always used to go hiking at uh, Goose Creek State Park. So I was wondering, what's your opinion on the park? Oh, it's great. Uh, I used to take my students hiking in there every year. And uh, when we first started going down Goose Creek, it was still kind of an primitive state in that there were no paved roads to speak of in there, it seemed like. Uh, and some of the Nature Trails was still in a primitive state. But we had a good time. It was a very good learning experience, not only for the students, but for me as well. Right. And of course, we still go down there, still have a good time. You and I went down there and caught fish that day, that right off the beach. I remember that. Some trout and stuff. And that was kind of fun. Uh, and it's just a lot to do down there. It's just an enjoyable, pleasurable place to go. And it seems like every time I go, I learn something new. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I myself can remember tracking deer down the trails and chasing snakes off into the woods. Um, have you ever had any bad experiences there, like maybe poison ivy or something such as that? Uh, not poison ivy so much as ticks. I think one of the first times I ever went down there I was not aware of the number of ticks would be down there in the spring of the year. <laughs> All right. And I took a small class down on a field trip down one of the trails. We all got ticks. I mean, we just invested with them. Oh, man. Back. And uh, that, that was one thing I remember. And of course, after that, I thought more and more about being careful about where I went and making right. sure I was loaded down with bug repellent before I got <laughs> in there. All right. Um, well, that was my last question. So okay. thank you very much for your time and your interview. Okay.